And thank you all for joining us for our presentation on navigating the reasonable accommodation process. Again, my name is Dennis DeYoung, and I am a business relations specialist here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. My primary role is assisting students and adults with disabilities in finding permanent employment with the state of Ohio through our apprenticeship program, as well as advocating for the job seekers we serve with state agencies. Today, I'm co-presenting with my colleague, Julie Wood. Julie is our worksite accessibility specialist, and we have some great information and resources to share with you about the reasonable accommodation process. Most of our discussion will highlight some best practices on the steps involved, and then we will talk about the importance of managing the process and training employees. Julie, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how your role supports employers and today's presentation? Thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be presenting with you. And hello to all of you joining us. We are certainly happy you're here today. My name is Julie Wood. I am an occupational therapist working in a fabulous role here at OOD as the Worksite Accessibility Specialist. I have the privilege of working directly with you, our employer partners, when you have questions or projects that relate to accessibility in your workplace. My job is to listen to what your goal is and then gather resources and information to support you in achieving that goal. Sometimes that information is delivered in a formal report and at other times it is delivered in an educational presentation to your team. Over time, I have worked with several employers on quite a wide variety of topics, including providing general ideas on reasonable accommodations that could be effective in removing barriers at work or I've had employers whose goals are to better understand the standards and guidelines for improving the accessibility of the physical environment and the digital environment. And some employers have asked specific questions about how to navigate Title I of the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, such as what can I ask or not ask during the hiring process? Or how do I handle low performance when a disability is involved? Or what steps do I take when an employee requests an accommodation at work? That last example is the inspiration for today's presentation, which includes information on best practices and ideas to support you in customizing a process that works best for you. So you can efficiently and effectively identify solutions for the requests you receive for reasonable accommodations. In addition to our discussion today, we do have some resources that are available for you that Dennis is going to tell you more about. Yes, thank you, Julie. Along with the PowerPoint slides, you have a learner's guide, which includes more information than what we will cover today and the resources we use to create the training. We have also created a fact sheet and a flow chart to highlight the steps in the reasonable accommodation process. You can access these through the employers page of the OOD website at www.ood.ohio.gov. You can also find the link directly to those in the Q&A section here in Microsoft Teams. As a reminder, the information shared in these resources and during today's presentation is only for educational purposes and is not legal advice. But we do hope this information is helpful as you consider how you navigate the reasonable accommodation process. Today's presentation, during today's presentation, we will stop to answer your questions between main topics. Please post any questions you have in the Q&A section so that they're ready for us to address when we stop. And with that, let's begin. Julie, I know this presentation is focused on navigating the process and not on specific examples of reasonable accommodations, but could you tell us briefly what reasonable accommodations are and why they are a good investment? Sure, that's a great place to start. A reasonable accommodation is a change in the hiring process or in the workplace that enables applicants and employees with disabilities to participate in hiring activities and work tasks. 
as well as to access the environment. Now, not every person with a disability will need an accommodation, but when an accommodation is needed, it's important to remember that each person and each employer are unique. And because of that, accommodations must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis every time. Having a process can make that easier to do. I'd like to take just a moment to share how providing reasonable accommodations can be a good investment. A study that was referenced in the Small Business at Work Toolkit from the Northeast ADA Center revealed that employees with disabilities have higher performance ratings, are absent less, and stay on the job. These studies also show that 58% of accommodations are free, and those that are not have a median cost of $500. These results demonstrate a business case for hiring people with disabilities and indicate that when an accommodation is needed, it is a good investment. There definitely is a business case for both hiring people with disabilities and also providing reasonable accommodations. Let's go ahead now and turn our focus to the process of providing these accommodations. Julie, is having a process required? Dennis, the simple answer to that is no. As we know, Title I of the ADA requires covered employers to provide reasonable accommodations to qualified applicants and employees with disabilities unless doing so causes an undue hardship. Title I is enforced by the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. To support employers, the EEOC has published several documents that provide guidance on how to navigate Title I. And this includes guidance on what constitutes a request for an accommodation, what questions you may ask the applicant or employee, what documentation you can obtain and when, and what is considered reasonable. And so we will talk about some of these guidelines as we discuss the process. But neither the ADA or the EEOC requires you to create a formal process for requesting or providing accommodations. The ADA just requires you engage with the person making the request in an informal collaboration, which is called the interactive process, to identify an effective solution. So while it may not be a requirement, it sounds like there is some helpful guidance to be aware of and some best practices that show how developing a formal process could be beneficial. Dennis, that is correct. Having a process really means knowing ahead of time what your plan is for handling a request for an accommodation when you receive one. And absolutely, there are benefits to establishing a process. First, a formal process can ensure requests are responded to quickly and handled efficiently. Second, having a process and documenting your efforts may demonstrate a good faith effort in complying with Title I. And third, when you educate your employees of their right to reasonable accommodation and provide training on the process, you create a culture of inclusion and send a message to employees that you care about them and what they need to participate fully at work. We have gathered some of the EEOC guidance as well as some best practices from the Job Accommodation Network and other resources and collectively organized the process into a series of eight steps. Now, certainly there is more than one way to navigate a process so we encourage you to consider this information when you evaluate the best way for your company to provide accommodations. Those are definitely great benefits. In today's training, we are going to discuss the process one step at a time. And the steps we have organized this into include step one, which is the accommodation request, step two, which is gathering information Step three is identifying options. Step four is choosing a solution. Step five is providing the accommodation. 
Step six is monitoring the accommodation. Step seven is managing the process. And step eight includes training staff. Julie, let's start with step one. OK, step one begins when a request is received for a change in the hiring process or in the workplace from an applicant or an employee. And that may sound easy enough, but there are some things to be aware of. A request may not always be easy to recognize, so it's important to know what constitutes a request. First, a request does not have to be made in writing. The person can request the accommodation in their preferred form of communication, which could be through sending an email or verbally making a request. Second, the person may use plain language, which means the request does not have to reference the ADA or use the term reasonable accommodation. When an applicant or an employee communicates a problem, either with the hiring process or in the workplace, and relates this to a medical condition, you have just received a request for an accommodation. It can be that simple. Julie, can you share with us an example of what is and what is not a request for a reasonable accommodation? Sure, I have an example of each that are directly from the EEOC guidance. The first example is an employee tells her supervisor, I'm having trouble getting to work at my scheduled starting time because of medical treatments I'm undergoing. This is a request for a reasonable accommodation because the employee indicates a problem with getting to work on time and relates this to a medical condition by referencing the medical treatments she is undergoing. The second example is an employee tells his supervisor that he would like a new chair because his present one is uncomfortable. Although this is a request for a change at work, his statement is insufficient to put the employer on notice that he is requesting reasonable accommodation because he does not link his need for the new chair with a medical condition. So this is not a request for a reasonable accommodation. So when can a person make a request? I know we have been asked why people aren't required to ask for accommodations when they're interviewing for a job or before they start work. That's a great question, Dennis. A request can be made at any point in the hiring process or during employment, and there's a few reasons why. The first reason is requesting an accommodation requires a person to disclose a disability because having a disability is a requirement of being protected by the ADA. It's entirely up to the person with a disability to choose if and when they want to share that information. The second reason is People don't always know they need an accommodation for the job until they access the work environment and begin performing the job. Job descriptions and interviews can be very informative, but they don't always include all the information a person might need to know an accommodation is necessary. The third reason a person may not request an accommodation right away is because one is not needed until something changes. That can include a change to a medical condition or a change in the workplace. It can also include when a person acquires a disability later, either due to the aging process or an injury. So there are many valid reasons why a person may need to request an accommodation at various times during employment, and certainly that is permitted. Julie, when an employer receives a request for an accommodation, what is the first thing they should do? Dennis, the EEOC guide tells us we want to act expeditiously, which means once you receive a request, you should act quickly to begin the accommodation process. First, you want to contact the person making the request so they know it was received. Next, inform the person of what the steps in the process include and what to expect. And then schedule a time to discuss the request further if you're not planning to do so in that initial conversation. Thank you, Julie. We are ready for step two, which includes gathering the information needed to process the request. What is unique about this step? 
This part of the process is an interactive collaboration between you and the person making the request to learn what the person needs and then figure out the solution together. This is why the EEOC refers to this as the interactive process. And this is a good time to remember that each person, each disability, each workplace, and each employer's situation is unique. And because this is always true, each request for an accommodation must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. What you're trying to identify in this step is what the person is experiencing in the hiring process or with performing the job or with accessing the environment that is acting as a barrier to successfully participating in the work-related activity and how this barrier can be overcome through implementing a reasonable accommodation. Julie, I imagine there are times a person's disability and the need for reasonable accommodation is obvious. For example, when a, an employee who uses a wheelchair reports the path from his workstation to the conference room is not wide enough for him to maneuver the wheelchair between the two spaces, the barrier is obvious and so is the need to remove that barrier. But what happens when the disability, the need for an accommodation, or both are not obvious? Dennis, that's an important distinction. When the disability or the need for accommodation is not obvious, you may ask the person questions to verify the disability exists and to better understand the need for the accommodation. You are also permitted to request medical documentation to obtain this information. The EEOC has created guidelines around what is permitted when asking questions or obtaining medical documentation. Let's talk about a few important points from that guidance. You are permitted to ask for reasonable documentation, which means you should only request what you absolutely need to verify the disability exists, to understand the functional limitations related to the disability that are impacted at work, and to verify a reasonable accommodation is needed. It is extremely rare that you would ever need a person's entire medical file. You may require that the documentation come from an appropriate medical professional, such as a doctor, a licensed mental health professional, an occupational or physical therapist, or a vocational rehabilitation specialist. It's important to know that although you are permitted to request documentation, you are not required to. You could choose to ask the person questions to understand the nature of the disability and the need for an accommodation instead of requiring documentation. If you decide to do that, it's helpful to explain to the person why this information is needed. So Julie, why would you want to skip the step of obtaining documentation? Dennis, sometimes obtaining documentation takes a while and that can delay the process. A delay may not be desirable when you are on a timeline to interview applicants for a job. Also, when you are waiting for documentation, you likely delay identifying the solution for a reasonable accommodation, which could lead to downtime when an employee is not able to perform an essential job task. Also, when you choose to first ask the person about the need for the accommodation and about the accommodation itself, you might find that what the person needs is simple to implement and you'd rather just move toward the solution rather than waiting for documentation. For example, an employee with depressive disorder may request a flexible schedule to be able to arrive to work early and leave work early on Thursdays for six weeks to be able to attend a therapy appointment to manage her condition. This is an accommodation that appears to be free. And if you determine it is simple and reasonable to provide, it may make sense to move on to the implementation step instead of waiting to obtain documentation. That is helpful to know that while you are permitted to obtain documentation, you are not required to. And certainly there are reasons you may choose to move forward in the process without documentation. 
Whether you are asking questions or obtaining documentation, you will be handling sensitive and personal medical information. How is confidentiality handled? Well, first, it's important to inform the person that all medical information shared with the employer will be kept confidential. This includes information you learn from the request for an accommodation itself, any answers to the questions you ask, and all the information you receive in documentation. It may also be helpful to explain to the person who this information can be shared with. The EEOC provides guidance on how medical information should be handled to make sure it remains confidential. And this includes recording medical information in its own file that is separate from general personnel files and storing this information in separate filing cabinets or electronic databases. And this is because not all human resources staff are permitted to access medical files. There are times certain information is permitted to be shared with designated parties. For example, necessary information may be shared with those employees who are responsible to implement accommodations for safety reasons or during emergency situations. Or at times, it's necessary to share specific information with a supervisor for the proper implementation and use of a reasonable accommodation. However, in these situations, the parties don't need to know about the medical reason for the accommodation. They just need the specific information about the presence of or the use of the reasonable accommodation. Okay. So now we have the information we need to start exploring options. Usually there is more than one way to accomplish a task. Sometimes we get stuck in thinking a task or a process has to be completed in the customary way we've always done it. However, in the next step, we want to be open to new ideas and the possibility of doing things in other ways. Dennis, that is one of the key messages I hope everyone leaves today's presentation with the understanding that there is often more than one way to perform a task. There, there certainly is. How do we identify our options? As you mentioned earlier, Dennis, sometimes the solution is obvious. But for those times when the reasonable accommodation is not obvious and options need to be explored, both the person making the request and you as the employer can contribute in important ways to finding options. A person with a disability often knows what accommodation will work best. So it's important to start with asking the person what ideas they have. You as the employer have expertise in your company's policies, systems, and practices which is helpful in understanding how an accommodation can work within these parameters. There will be times when you and the person requesting the accommodation are able to determine options for an effective solution. However, there will be times when, although you both can identify the workplace barrier and the need for an accommodation, you are not able to identify reasonable solutions. When this happens, there are outside sources which can offer help. Our agency, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, provides services and support for people with disabilities to help attain and maintain employment at no cost. Our vocational rehabilitation services are voluntary and customized for each person through assessments and one-on-one -on -one meetings with professional counselors. Ohioans with disabilities who are interested in services may visit www.oodworks.com to learn about our services and apply. Julie, what other resources are available? Well, with the employee's permission, you can ask their medical provider for recommendations on accommodations or to comment about a specific accommodation that is being considered. You can also reach out to the Job Accommodation Network, known as JAN, and the ADA National Network. These organizations offer guidance on workplace accommodations to both employers and individuals. We did include their websites in the learner's guide. When you are consulting with these outside sources, it's important to remember to follow the rules for confidentiality. And as you begin to acquire options from these sources, 
remember that this is an interactive process. And so make sure you and the employee are working collaboratively to determine the effectiveness of each option and its ability to remove the workplace barrier. It's great to know you aren't in this alone and what outside sources are available to help identify options. We are going to stop now to address any questions that have come in. <clears throat> Hi, Julie. Hi, Dennis. We do have a few questions that have come in. The first one is, could an employer have issues if sometimes they require documentations and sometimes they don't for expediency? This is Julie, I can answer that. Um, the guidance doesn't speak directly to that. They just say that you as the employer are able to obtain documentation when you need to and they give you some criteria for that. Um, every time we look at reasonable accommodation, we handle this or address this on a case by case basis. So I would just recommend for the times that you require documentation that you state why. And for the times that you don't, just keep a record of why you didn't to kind of justify your decision in each of the case by case situations. Um, for example, during the pandemic, um, at least early on in the pandemic, there was a delay in getting information um, documentation back. And so employers may have decided to move forward with a trial accommodation uh, while they were either waiting for documentation or instead of getting documentation because of that special circumstance. So um, I would just document your reasoning for each time that you go through the process um, as to why you are or are not getting documentation. Thanks, Julie. Next question. If during an employment interview, the applicant brings up the fact they would need a reasonable accommodation to do the job, you may not have the time to go into what that entails in the allotted interview time slot and all ask all of the interview questions needed. How would you handle that? This is Julie, I can answer that. Um, what I would recommend in the interview before you've made an offer when you're identifying um, the person's ability to perform the job is just ask if, if they could describe how the accommodation would help them to perform the job duties. And I would I would keep it that simple. And, and if you feel like you need to see a demonstration of it at a later time, maybe schedule that for a separate time after the interview. OK, thanks, Julie. Next question. Are there any taboo questions that shouldn't be asked when finding out what reasonable accommodation is needed? This is Julie. Um, again, when you're asking when you're going through the reasonable accommodation process, you are trying to identify what's the barrier in the workplace related to the medical condition that is, is um, getting in the way of the person being able to perform the task. And so keep your questions on, on that. Um, you only wanna know as much about the disability that answers that question. What is the specific limitation that's related to work and what is the solution for overcoming that? So I would just keep it simple, but there's not a, a, a list of taboo questions. All right, thanks, Julie. Last question for this break. Is there a monetary value that would indicate an undue hardship? This is Julie. I can I can take that one. Um, what the EEOC guidance offers is a list of criteria for establishing if something is reasonable or if something causes an undue hardship. And so each employer should go through an assessment with each request for an accommodation because it's always case by case. Um, each employer is unique and, it, and the determination of cost and undue hardship is gonna be based on a few different things. So the size of employer that you are, how many locations you have, how many employees you have, and those kind of things. So there's not um, just one monetary number for employers to go by. It's really a case-by-case -case assessment each time. Thank you. Okay, we can continue moving on. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, and thank you for your questions. At this point, we have talked about how to request an accommodation, how to gather the information we need to move forward with the request, and ways to identify options. Now we are ready to choose the solution. Julie, who makes this decision about which option is selected? 
Ultimately, you as the employer do retain the right to choose the effective accommodation. So if there is more than one effective solution and one is less expensive or easier to implement, you may decide to go with that option. However, you are encouraged to consider the person's preference. Either way, once the accommodation is selected, you should discuss the choice with the person and inform them of what to expect next in the process. There are some unique circumstances that can occur in this step that I'd like to address. You may not always know whether an accommodation is effective until you try it. In my experience as an occupational therapist, there have been times when we tried a certain tool or piece of equipment in the work environment and the accommodation didn't work as we hoped. For example, I remember implementing a certain ergonomic stool for an employee that we thought would be effective, but it wasn't, and we had to replace it with another one. Fortunately, the second one worked. This may sound frustrating, but at times this is the reality, and I suggest we all offer each other some grace and know that sometimes it will take some trial and error to find the best solution. Based on my own trial and error history from working with clients in my previous role, I do have some ideas that may be helpful. You could consider a trial period for the accommodation to try it out and see if it's going to be effective. If you do this, it's important to include a written agreement between you and the person so you are both aware the accommodation is being tested and is not a permanent decision at this point. And the agreement should include how long the trial is expected to last, how the person can communicate along the way if something isn't working well, and what will happen if the accommodation doesn't work. A trial period sounds like a great option to consider. What ideas do you have for employers when the accommodation they want to try requires a purchase for something like equipment or tools? Dennis, there are a few ideas I'd recommend in that situation. First, find out if the item can be tested in the work environment before you buy it. We have some lending libraries throughout Ohio that may permit you to borrow an item and use it in the workplace. Now, these libraries do not have every item out there, so they may not always be an option. However, it is worth checking. We've included links for lending libraries in the learner's guide. If you are not able to test the item at work first, consider whether there is a store nearby that sells the item where you may be able to go and assess it or try it in the store. In my previous role, I have done this several times with office ergonomic equipment. For example, I often made recommendations for clients who needed ergonomic chairs. Now, not all ergonomic chairs are the same, so the best way to know which chair is the most effective for the person is to be able to try out a variety of options. Fortunately, I found a store that would allow me to come in and meet with clients so the person could sit in a variety of chairs to test them out and I could assess the ergonomic fit. That gave us a better chance of selecting a chair that would be effective in the work environment before purchasing one. And lastly, and maybe more often than not, you will have to buy the item first and use it to determine if it works. What I recommend here is that especially for any item that might be on the pricier side, is to ask about the return policy. Find out how long you can have the item before it has to be returned. Also, ask about the return shipping fees and whether there are any restock fees involved. Those are great suggestions for ways to try the chosen accommodation first to determine if it will be effective. Julie, you mentioned in the beginning of our presentation that employers must provide reasonable accommodations unless they cause an undue hardship, which means the accommodation is too costly or too difficult to implement. Since undue hardship is something employers may face as they evaluate the options for accommodations, what are some best practices employers should consider? Well, 
That is correct, Dennis, and it is helpful to understand ways to determine whether an accommodation is reasonable or whether it causes an undue hardship. Remember earlier I mentioned studies show more than half of accommodations cost nothing and the others have a mean cost of $500. This means most accommodations are not going to cause an undue hardship. But there are times undue hardship happens and the EEOC provides guidance on how to determine this. So I would certainly encourage you to review that information and I'll share a few main points with you now. First, make sure all options are considered before determining there is no reasonable solution. And next, if you determine that all options cause an undue hardship, be prepared to explain the reason for this determination. And just like a reasonable accommodation is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, so is undue hardship, and you need to do an analysis to arrive at this conclusion. This analysis is detailed in the guidance, but includes things like the cost of the accommodation, the overall financial resources of the business, the number of employees, the number of facilities, the type of business, and the impact of the accommodation on the business. When you are considering if the accommodation is too costly, there are sources that may be able to help offset the cost. We've included these in the learner's guide, and some of these include a funding guide put together by the Assistive Technology Industry Association. There is a link to information on the IRS website that explains tax benefits for businesses who employ people with disabilities or that make changes to make the work environment accessible. Individuals with disabilities can voluntarily apply for services with our agency. Opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities, as Dennis described earlier. There are times when our agency can help to determine an appropriate accommodation and on a case by case basis, help to provide accommodations to help a person attain work or remain at work. Also, one idea that isn't discussed much, but is an option is to ask the employee to pay the portion of the accommodation that you have determined is an undue hardship. This should be considered after a proper assessment of the accommodation and consideration of the funding sources we mentioned. Okay, that is helpful to know about undue hardship, but let's move forward now with providing the reasonable accommodation. I imagine some accommodations are simple to implement and others may be a bit more involved. Dennis, you are absolutely right. Some accommodations are more involved and benefit from having a plan to follow. Let's talk about a few examples and what factors to consider. Some accommodations need to be installed. For example, a blind employee that will be using the JAWS screen reader on his computer will need this installed and the software will require periodic updates. So one idea for this to be implemented easily is to assign an employee, likely from IT, to coordinate the installation and to be responsible for providing any software updates. Some accommodations require a learning curve. For example, an employee with an above the elbow amputation of the left arm may choose to use a single-handed keyboard. This kind of keyboard is operated differently than a standard keyboard. So while this solution can be effective, the employee will need some time to learn how to use the new keyboard. One idea is to give the employee the necessary time to learn how to use the new accommodation and provide training when it's needed. If it's appropriate, assign an employee to oversee that training is provided and is effective. When you implement an accommodation that changes a policy or a schedule, remember to inform anyone this impacts, such as a supervisor. For example, if an employee with diabetes is receiving an accommodation that changes a policy and permits having food and drink at the workstation to manage taking medication, make sure the supervisor is aware of this change. Sometimes an accommodation will be implemented as needed, such as providing a sign language interpreter. 
This typically requires coordination with an outside service. One idea is to assign someone the responsibility of coordinating this accommodation effectively. By assigning employees to be responsible for coordinating the implementation of an accommodation, it is more likely the accommodation will be effective. Just remember that confidentiality rules apply here as well. For example, the supervisor may know about the policy change that allows the employee to have food and drink at the workstation, but is not permitted to know the employee has diabetes. I can see that assigning an employee to coordinate the various factors of implementing an accommodation is beneficial. I imagine that accommodations being implemented, there may be questions from employees asking why their coworkers are receiving special treatment. Dennis, this is a good topic to discuss because employees may ask about the accommodations they notice in the work environment. We've talked about confidentiality and that disclosing medical information is not allowed. Because these questions often catch us off guard, it can be helpful to plan a response ahead of time so when you receive the question, you are ready with an answer. What you do not want to say is that the employee is receiving a reasonable accommodation. That term, reasonable accommodation, is unique to the ADA and to receive one, a person must have a disability. So in using that term, we would be disclosing that a person has a disability. You may respond by saying something like, it is your policy to assist employees at work and that these matters are personal and confidential. You could further respond to the coworkers saying if they needed assistance at work, their privacy would be respected just the same. We recommend you consult with your HR team and your legal professionals to create a response for these kinds of questions. We have included examples from the EEOC in the learner's guide for you to reference as you consider a statement that fits your work environment best. One best practice is to provide education to new employees at orientation and to all employees on a regular schedule about the laws you are required to follow, such as the Family Medical Leave Act, workers' compensation laws, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. When employees are better informed about these kinds of laws, it may increase their awareness of accommodations in the workplace and prevent them from having these kinds of questions. Julie, I understand the employer may not disclose an employee's disability but may an employee choose to disclose their disability to coworkers? Yes, the employee may choose to share their disability with coworkers. Of course, disclosure is not mandatory and is always the decision of the employee with the disability. Because the employee himself may receive questions from fellow coworkers about accommodations, it might be beneficial during the implementation phase of the reasonable accommodation process to have a conversation about this with the employee. This encourages the employee to think about how he feels about disclosure and decide whether he wants his coworkers to know about his disability before any questions are asked. This could help him to formulate a response he feels comfortable with when talking with coworkers. One final aspect of workplace communications I want to mention is the hopefully rare but still possible situation of gossip and harassment. When reasonable accommodations are implemented, it may lead to coworkers discussing the employee with a disability, which could result in gossip and harassment. One way to prevent this is by providing education on proper communications in the workplace for all employees. Another idea is to educate your staff in general about employees with disabilities. One of the ways OOD can support your efforts is through the no-cost disability awareness and disability etiquette training provided by our business relations team. These trainings provide information geared toward making everyone feel more comfortable and included in the work environment. Yes, and in July, two of our business relations specialists delivered a virtual training on disability etiquette that we have archived on our website at 
www.ood.ohio.gov. You can find the recording on our employers page along with the fact sheets and learner's guide. We have also included a link to this training in the learner's guide along with information on how to contact us at OOD regarding these trainings. Thank you, Julie. The tips you shared are definitely helpful for identifying ways to answer those difficult questions that can catch us off guard. We are going to stop again to address any questions that have come in. Hi, Julie and Dennis. We have several questions that have come in. The first one is, due to teleworking, there are many employees asking for the same perks, such as dual monitors, et cetera, they had in the workplace. Is the employer required to provide if not covered under ADA? Um, this is Julie, I can answer that. Um, in that situation related to the ADA, if a person has a disability and they're requesting an accommodation, you would go through this process to determine if it's reasonable. If it's not related to that, um, you would follow whatever other procedures you decide uh, or that you follow to decide what equipment people can have in the workstation. And in this unique situation um, of teleworking, um, I don't know that there's a precedence for how to recommend that you that you follow this at, at this time. OK, thanks, Julie. Next question. Our employees do not always agree with us that certain tasks in their job are essential duties, which is 50 pound lifting requirement. Can you speak to essential duties and what to do if an employee cannot perform those with or without an accommodation? Um, this is Julie. So the guidance does speak to some criteria for determining what an essential function is and so you as the employer um, have the discretion to determine what those are and there is guidance out there from the EEOC to help you establish what those duties are that are essential. Um, certainly that's information I can help connect you with if that's helpful. Um, all employees are expected to be able to perform the essential duties of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation and so um, if a person is not qualified for the job, you would follow the same procedure that you would with any employee. Um, what would be unique with a person with a disability? Let's say they already have the job and then there's something about an essential function that they're not able to perform and you have not been able to identify a um, effective, reasonable accommodation is that um, one accommodation you can consider as kind of a, a last resort is reassignment to a vacant position and there's quite a lot of guidance in the EEOC about that that I could help point you to because you'd really want to take a look at what the parameters are in that situation but that's what I would re recommend that you look into. Okay thanks Julie. Next question. What happens if we have multiple employees in the job classification who ask for various medical accommodations? Do we have to accommodate everyone? How does everyone get their jobs get? How do all their jobs get done? Uh, this is Julie. I can take that one as well. So reasonable accommodations. I know I sound like a broken record, but they are considered on a case by case basis. And so as you receive these, you evaluate each one at a time and it could be possible that at some point if an employer is being asked to provide several reasonable accommodations if you determine at some point that something is an undue hardship you know following the criteria for the assessment to do that that could happen but you would want to take these one at a time as you receive them and give them each their individual assessment to determine if they're reasonable um, and and remember to to look for all the options remember the resources that are out there that dennis and i mentioned about the tax um, the tax benefits um, the lending libraries, the um, ability for an individual to reach out for our services when you're making that assessment of undue hardship. OK, thank you. Next question. Sometimes the only way we can accommodate is by providing a continuous leave of absence. Can you speak to LOA as an accommodation in its reasonableness? This is Julie. I can I can 
acknowledge that that is a form of reasonable accommodation that the um, EEOC does give us as an option. When we talk about leave, there's um, there's some other laws that may come into play. There's some other times that we use leave, and so it can become a more complex conversation. Um, I would be happy to talk with you offline and really dive into the guidance to kind of help point you to some criteria or information that could help you navigate that. But I don't know that there's a um, a specific answer that I can give on on how how long you can use that under Title I of the ADA for your unique situation. I'm sorry. Thanks, Julie. In the interest of time, we'll continue moving forward. Thank you again for all of your questions. OK, so now we have taken all the steps to implement the accommodation successfully. It might feel like we are finished now, right? But we aren't. Why? Because as we all know, especially in 2020, change happens. Certainly the accommodation might be working great at the start and for quite a long period of time into the future, but it's almost a guarantee that something is going to change and that change could impact the effectiveness of the accommodation. So we want to build into our reasonable accommodation process a monitoring step. You might be wondering what kind of changes can occur that impact the reasonable accommodation. So let's find out what those are. Dennis, accommodations can stop being effective when there is a change in an employee's disability. Some conditions remain the same, but others may change. For example, an employee who is hard of hearing and uses an assistive listening device may progress to having a total loss of hearing that results in needing a different accommodation possibly one that provides speech to text output, like using live captioning for meetings and trainings. Sometimes when a condition changes, an additional accommodation is needed. For example, the condition of multiple sclerosis can cause fatigue and muscular weakness that progresses over time. This condition may cause an employee to initially need an accommodation for a flexible schedule, that allows her to work during hours when her energy level is most optimal. If the condition prog progresses, the employee may need to use a wheelchair to conserve energy when moving about the workplace. This change to using a wheelchair could lead to needing an additional accommodation, such as providing wider pathways for the employee to effectively navigate the work environment. Accommodations can also stop being effective when there is a work-related change. Maybe the employee is promoted to a new job with different essential functions and needs a different accommodation. Or maybe new equipment is being used in the work environment, or the work environment itself is changing. For example, an employee with autism is receiving an accommodation at work for a private office that is free of auditory distractions that helps him to focus on work tasks. But during the pandemic, the company has transitioned employees to working remotely from home. In the home environment, the employee is distracted by the sounds of other family members working, as well as neighborhood noise, such as delivery trucks and dogs who are barking outside. So the employer and the employee may decide that an effective accommodation in the new work environment is for the employee to wear noise canceling earbuds to offset these auditory distractions and be able to focus on work. Julie, can accommodations change when the employer's situation changes? Can an accommodation that was reasonable become an undue hardship? Absolutely, Dennis. The employer's situation can impact a reasonable accommodation for a variety of reasons. First, if an employer has provided a reasonable accommodation during a special situation, such as for teleworking during the pandemic, the reasonable accommodation may no longer be needed once the special circumstance is over and the employer is returning employees to the workplace. Also, if the nature of the business changes or the financial situation of the business changes, an accommodation that once was a reasonable accommodation may become an undue hardship. When that happens, a company still needs to properly assess the situation according to the EEOC guidance we referenced earlier before making this decision. 
But yes, this can occur. Because of all these reasons, it's important to periodically monitor all reasonable accommodations. At the end of the implementation step, once the accommodation is working effectively, it's a best practice to encourage ongoing communications with the employee. And that starts by advising the employee that you will be checking with them from time to time about the effectiveness of the accommodation. It's also beneficial to invite the employee to contact you at any time if there is a problem or when a change is needed. And again, it's a good idea to assign an employee to oversee this step and make sure the employee knows how to contact this person. Julie, I think creating a schedule for monitoring accommodations sounds like a great idea too, since we know accommodations may change over time. The next step in the process is really not a sequential step, but is an ongoing practice of managing the process to ensure it is working well. That's right, Dennis. The management step is an ongoing effort throughout the various steps of the process, and it's one of the most important steps to address because if your process is managed well, then your requests for accommodations are handled efficiently. This creates a culture where your employees know they can ask for what they need, and you can feel confident that your process will deliver accommodations that are reasonable and effective in enabling employees to perform their jobs without barriers. I have some ideas for you to consider to manage the process effectively. First, decide who is responsible for each step of the process. This could be the same person for the entire process, or you may decide to assign certain employees to specific tasks. Next, it can be helpful to outline and describe the expectations for both the employer and the employee at each step of the process. This helps to prevent any unnecessary delays in the process. It can also be helpful to include the criteria in writing for when medical questions may be asked and when documentation may be obtained. So the employee in charge of this step is using the proper guidance and only requesting necessary information when it's permitted and when it's needed. And it's important to indicate what role supervisors and managers serve in the process and include information about the rules for confidentiality. Another best practice is to indicate how you will assess whether an accommodation is reasonable or whether it causes an undue hardship. As we know, undue hardship should not be decided without a proper assessment. So it's a good idea to reference the EEOC guidance to establish your assessment. It is also very helpful to indicate how accommodations will be funded and even consider creating an accommodations budget. If you don't have one already, the simplest way to create a budget is to review how much your organization has spent on accommodations annually for the past five to 10 years to get an average amount. One of the best ways to manage your system and keep it organized is to track data. We recommend you create a system to track accommodations. This can be as simple as creating a spreadsheet and including things like dates, actions taken, status, and any changes made. This documentation allows everyone involved to know the status of an accommodation and shows a good faith effort for providing reasonable accommodations. If you are like me, it can be helpful to see an example of what others are doing before creating a new process or making changes to an existing process. Jan has a resource on their website, and we've included this in the learner's guide, which offers examples of accommodation policies, processes, forms, and training. So I would encourage you to check those resources to see if they're helpful before creating your own. I agree. Having an example of these resources to reference is a great starting point for creating new documents. We have arrived at our final step in the accommodation process. Just like step seven, step eight is not really a sequential step, but is an important part of ensuring the success of the process.
Step eight involves training staff. Julie, what kinds of training is important for the reasonable accommodation process? Dennis, there are a couple of types of training that are beneficial and can be tailored with specific content for the audience that you intend to reach. We are going to talk about what you may want to address in training for all employees and also for supervisors and managers. What is recommended to include in the training you provide for all employees is a focus on their right to reasonable accommodation if they are a qualified employee with a disability. And this right to accommodation applies to the hiring process, performing the essential functions of the job, and participating in the privileges of employment. It is also a good idea to include information on making a request for an accommodation and including the contact information for whomever you designate to receive requests. Most employers likely already provide this type of training as a part of their new employee onboarding process, and that is great. However, new employees typically receive so much information at onboarding and as they are transitioning to their new jobs that the message can get lost in all the new information they're receiving. So while this training is important to include at onboarding, it is also helpful to provide training on an ongoing basis for all employees to make sure employees remain aware of their right to request a reasonable accommodation. You may also consider supporting training with information included in employee handbooks on the company internet site and through company newsletters. Julie, I've heard you share with us in other trainings that it's also a good practice to make sure to include an accessibility statement on all your communications so applicants and employees know how to request a reasonable accommodation when one is needed. For example, it's helpful to include this statement with job postings, applications, and invitations for interviews and onboarding. And when you host a training or meeting for employees, include the statement in the announcement. Sometimes a person with a disability only needs an accommodation for a specific event or situation, such as a virtual meeting. And this statement reminds them of their right to request one. Yes, Dennis, that is a great point to mention. Thank you. And when you do include the accessibility statement, make sure to put it front and center in the announcement so it's easy for the person to find. When a person needs an accommodation, we want to make it easy for them to request one. We have included an example of an accessibility statement for you in the learner's guide. Okay, so now let's talk about what is recommended for the training provided for supervisors and managers. Dennis, it is helpful to focus this training on how to recognize a request for an accommodation and what steps to take when a request is received. Often an employee will request an accommodation by asking their supervisor for a change at work instead of going to someone in human resources. Because of this, it's important that supervisors and managers are also aware of the confidentiality rules that apply to medical information and reasonable accommodations. As we mentioned before, there are times when coworkers have questions about the reasonable accommodations they notice in the work environment. So training for supervisors should also address how to properly respond to any questions they receive from employees. Training employees is certainly beneficial to build awareness of their right to request a reasonable accommodation. And informing supervisors and managers of how to recognize a request and properly navigate the accommodation process increases the likelihood of the success of providing effective reasonable accommodations. But there is one additional and very important reason to provide this training. When you train your employees on reasonable accommodations and include an accessibility statement in all your communications, you begin to create a culture of inclusion and that sends a message to your employees that you care about them and what they need. And what a great message to send. We are going to stop a final time to address questions and then come back together before concluding today's presentation. Hi, Julie and Dennis. We've had several questions come in. First one, 
How does union representation play into the interactive process if the employee requests it? Uh, this is Julie. I can I could try to take that one, um, Dennis, unless you're more familiar with with that. Um, I know that the EEOC guidance does speak to that, um, and so I would imagine the union has um, within the what is permitted in the guidance a, a process that they go through. Um, and whether or not the person would have representation with them. So I would just recommend looking through that guidance to kind of establish the proper way to handle that. Thank you. Next question. Does an accommodation become unreasonable only if it causes undue hardship? This is Julie, um, an accommodation certainly um, could potentially become an undue hardship. Uh, you also want to give thought to whether or not it compromises safety in the in the work environment for the person or for others. And so if, if a direct threat is a result of an accommodation at some point, that could be considered as well as undue hardship. Thanks, Julie. Next question. If the employer provided ergonomic considerations in the workplace, are those same considerations required for teleworking employees or can the employer require a separate assessment? This is Julie, I can take that. Um, I'm not sure based on that question if the ergonomic equipment is provided in the work environment um, kind of from a general perspective for everyone or if it was related to a reasonable accommodation. Um, since we're talking about reasonable accommodation, I'll address it that way. So in the teleworking environment, if a person with a, if an employee with a disability needs an accommodation, certainly they are permitted to request one. And then you go through this process to evaluate whether or not it is um, reasonable at this point. And so again, I would just take it case by case and whether or not you have to provide it is based on, you know, whether or not it is a person with a disability and you deem that it's it's reasonable. OK, thank you. Next question. Julie, you mentioned that you could implement a trial period for an accommodation, but it should be in writing. We didn't do that. However, we are running into issues with JAWS being compatible with all of our applications. What are our options? And this is Julie. So it's just a best practice to have a written agreement um, if you have a trial period, but certainly we, we mentioned that you want to monitor accommodations because things can change. So. Um, while JAWS is a fairly popular screen reading program, there's others available. Um, there's the acronym NVDA is another screen reader that's out there. Um, I know that the Microsoft platform has Narrator, and so it might be a matter of just evaluating or assessing what is the screen reader that will work in your environment and taking another look at that accommodation. Thanks, Julie. Next question. I am HR and cover Ohio and Indiana. Could I use this information to guide my processes in other states? This is Julie. Yes, the Title I of the ADA, in fact, the entire ADA law is a federal law. And so we are speaking today um, based on Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so the guidance and resources that we're referencing um, would work across the country. Great. As Thank far you. as I'm sorry, Stephanie, as far as accessing um, services, if an individual wanted to reach out to our agency, that would need to be an Ohio resident. But aside from that, the resources and the education we're sharing should um, would definitely apply. Great. Thanks, Julie. Next question. Are there specific conditions that are covered under the ADA or is it similar to FMLA with vague definitions like serious health condition? This is Julie. Yes, the um, the ADA's definition of disability is a significant limitation or impairment. Forgive me if I don't remember that word exactly, but with a major life um, activity or a major bodily function. And so there is not a list of diagnoses and how it impacts a person's function. Thank you. Last question. Does providing accommodation on a temporary basis require us to then provide it permanently? 
Um, this is Julie. So if you're implementing something temporarily, what I would recommend um, as you're monitoring that and putting it maybe a, um, a deadline to that is why are we offering it temporarily? Is it a unique situation such as teleworking where maybe the accommodation is not going to be needed once the unique situation expires? And so if something's being offered temporarily um, because of a unique situation, I would just put a um, I would just put that into your documentation of the decision. If you're trialing something to see if it's going to work and you have that written agreement, then you kind of spell out in there when you'll be checking it. You advise the person to let you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's not effective and then how you'll handle it if the accommodation is deemed to not be effective and you're going to take a look at something different. So um, I would just document kind of the end date for these things and follow up and monitor so that you know when to reassess. Thanks, Julie. Those are all of our questions. Well, wonderful. Thank you. You have all had great questions today and we appreciate your interest in the topic. I'd like to close our presentation with some final thoughts. We've discussed many best practices for the reasonable accommodation process and presented these in a series of steps as an example of one way to navigate the process successfully. What we've been shown through these best practices is the importance in having a process established so when a request comes in, we are prepared to handle it efficiently. Many of the ideas and resources we've shared are with the intention of helping you to review your current process and make any additions you feel are best suited for you. As we mentioned in the very beginning of the presentation, there is a business case for hiring people with disabilities, and the results of these studies demonstrate that providing reasonable accommodations when they are needed is a good investment. Having an established reasonable accommodation process ensures a request for an accommodation is easy to make and can be considered and implemented effectively ultimately resulting in enabling applicants and employees with disabilities to fully participate in work-related activities. We hope the information we've shared is beneficial to you when reviewing how your company handles facilitating a request for an accommodation. It has been my pleasure to share this time with you, and Dennis, it has been great to co-present with you today. Thank you.